Good evening, and welcome to the third installment of How Would You Solve a Problem Like Mikado, co-presented by Intermountain Opera Bozeman and the Bozeman Public Library. My name is Michael Saker, and I'm the Artistic Director of Intermountain Opera Bozeman. Before we get started, I wanted to thank Intermountain Opera's partner in this webinar, Bozeman Public Library, along with the library's Head of Adult Learning and Outreach, Corey Sloan, who has been instrumental in bringing this presentation to you tonight. Over the past several weeks, we at Intermountain Opera have been asked, why are we adapting Gilbert and Sullivan's classic 19th century opera, The Mikado? And the simple truth is that GNS's original work for all its hilarity, its beauty and brilliance is no longer fit for public consumption. It misrepresents traditional Japanese culture with offensive character names like Nankipu and Yum Yum, not to mention a plot that minimizes ritual suicide and samurai culture. The opera's appropriation of quote Japanese music is another serious distortion of East Asia. Add to that centuries of white performers portraying false and harmful stereotypes in yellow face. And we at Intermountain Opera all agree that the original Mikado is too problematic to present on today's opera stage. Instead, own Sarah Allen, who will come later tonight, had the brilliant idea of embracing the original Mikado's satirical origins, making fun of 19th century Victorian culture, and create a new satire making fun of Bozeman today. The result, of course, is the Montana Mikado, which Intermountain Opera Bozeman will present at the Ellen Theater on February 4th through the 6th and 11th through the 13th, less than just two weeks away. Bozeman's own Soren Kissel has written a new and absolutely hilarious libretto with the same music from Sullivan's original score. I've been watching rehearsals and I cannot remember the last time that I've laughed so hard. This is a comic masterpiece and a theatrical experience unlike any that Bozeman has ever seen or heard before. I encourage all of you to run to the Intermountain Opera Bozeman website immediately following this webinar to buy your tickets. But we at Intermountain Opera didn't want to just ignore the problematic history of the original Mikado. Rather, we wanted to use this production as an opportunity to enrich our community with educational opportunities addressing representation in opera. In addition to this webinar series, Intermountain Opera Bozeman is partnering with Montana State University this Thursday, January 27th, to present a free lecture by Asian Studies Chair Professor Peter Tillak entitled Dislocating the Orient, which dives even deeper into the complicated and problematic history of the Mikado. Peter Tillak's lecture will take place at 7 p.m. at MSU's Student Union Building Ballroom A, and again, it is free to everyone to attend. Additionally, uh, Intermountain Opera will host pre-performance lectures at the Ellen one hour before each performance with writer and director Soren Kissel to learn more about how he created this new and hilarious work. And we will also host post-show talkbacks with members of the cast so you can ask questions to them after each show. But tonight, finally, I'm thrilled to introduce our host for tonight's webinar. Sarah Allen has crafted this series, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Mikado? to help us all appreciate the biases, stereotypes, and discrimination that are part of the original Mikado and that sadly are still a part of our society today. Sarah is an assistant professor in the Department of Development at Southern Utah University. Over the past 20 years, her research and teaching have centered on diversity training along with individual, family, and community health and well-being. She's on the board of numerous arts organizations, including Intermountain Opera Bozeman, and has a passion for the arts and its capacity to positively transform individuals and institutions. We're also joined by tonight's special guest. Mezzo-soprano Kristen Choi has been described by Opera News as a powerhouse in the making. Her recent performance highlights include leading roles with Washington National Opera, Santa Fe Opera, Glimmer Glass Opera, and Virginia Opera. Sarah and Kristen, welcome. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Michael. I'm so excited to be sharing the mic tonight with Kristen to explore microaggressions um, together. Just to give you a little bit of a roadmap as to how we're gonna be spending our time together, we're really gonna be focusing on three core questions. What are microaggressions? What is their impact? 
how can I interrupt them? And if we have some time, maybe practice through some hypothetical situations, and then we'll open the floor for questions. And I know uh, many of you will have questions as we move through that content, just go ahead and put it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We won't be able to get to it until we get to the end of our webinar, but I know sometimes it's hard to remember what your question was you know, 30 minutes ago. So please just type them in as they come and we'll um, spend some time addressing that. Um, but before we jump into our first question, I, I do like to sort of um, set our learning goals and, and intentions for our time together and first start by recognizing and honoring all of those who have suffered or lost their lives um, in association with this most recent uptick in anti-Asian American hate crimes. The FBI came out with numbers in October of a 76% increase between 2020 and 21. And between 2019 and 2020, the Center for Hate and Extremism um, has an, um, reported an increase of 149%. So real people, real lives, real suffering. So we wanted to take a moment to, to recognize and honor them and also extend some gratitude. As we go through this presentation tonight, I'll be sharing a lot of research um, from some of my colleagues um, who are producing sort of tier one peer reviewed journal articles on this very, very topic. And so I wanna give a big shout out and thanks to them for helping to inform the content of our discussion. And lastly, just invite everyone to um, consider their positionality. We're all entering this conversation from a very unique constellation of our social identities, our race, our class, our gender, sexual orientation is all forming what we know and don't know about microaggressions. And if microaggressions is a new term to you and, you're, and you've never maybe um, experienced them, that might signal that you are in a privileged position. And so just kind of um, recognizing um, all the different ways that we enter into this really important and critical conversation. Lastly, um, just want to set our, our learning intention to, uh, we're coming here together to learn and that, that cr and create a brave space. And for those of you who've been on webinars one and two, some of this is familiar, welcome back. Nice to see you again. And some of you are new. Uh, so warm welcome to all of our new webinar participants. And um, this, is, this is sort of like when you go to a yoga class and, you're, and your yoga teacher reminds you to breathe. It's the same kind of thing. I'm just going to gently remind you that what we're encountering is difficult. Um, when talking about race is not always easy. So recognizing that um, and recognizing that if we enter this space with an intention to learn and to grow, um, we can sort of invite ourselves to move out of our comfort zone. And if we encounter fear or anger or defensiveness or shame or guilt, um, just be intentional and curious about that and ask questions about that so you don't get stuck there um, because that's all the magic happens in that learning and growth place. So just set your intention to bring your best self, your best thinking, your best questions, your best intentions. Um, maybe get comfortable feeling a little bit uncomfortable, but if we have an open heart, um, we can often have an open mind. So with that um, preface, we're going to jump into our first question, which is just a definition. What is a microaggression. And I'm going to rely on Dr. Daryl Sue, who is an expert in the field of microaggressions. He defines it as the brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional. And that little caveat is actually really, really important. We're going to unpack that in a lot more detail later. Um, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults to the target person or group. So I know that's a big mouthful. It's a lot of a lot of terms, but um, it's because it's so commonplace. Um, it happens more often than you think, and um, different people have described it as sort of like a low-grade stressor. So um, it's a, a wound of a thousand paper cuts, or being, you know, bitten by thousands of mosquitoes not any single one will kill you, but that cumulative impact and chronic stressor and daily sort of exposure um, to maybe feeling not exactly safe in your place or um, potentially hostile or derogatory comments um, sent your way. So when we start thinking about how did they play out in everyday interactions, these are just a few slides when we asked um, Asian American students on campus, what is their experience with microaggressions? And these are some of the phrases that they, they shared. Um, statements like, you're not really Asian. Um, so like, what are you? Or no, where are you really from? 
um, to, do you speak English? You're really good with numbers, right? Or so what do you guys speak in Japan, Asian? So these are just different kind of um, forms that it might take. And it's, again, if you sort of have that constant sort of background noise of these very small, just kind of questions or comments, like um, you're a foreigner, um, uh, say something to me in, in Chinese, um, you're not Asian enough, what are you? So just this ongoing sort of questions that for some people might, they might seem somewhat benign or just um, curious, but um, they have a different kind of impact. But I do wanna just check in right off the bat um, with you, Kristen, um, if you can maybe just share a little bit about who you are and then also if you have any sort of immediate sort of connections to those images that I just shared. Yeah, um, so hi, I'm Kristen Jay. Uh, I'm a mezzo-soprano um, singer. I'm Korean American. So I was born uh, in the valley <laughs> in Northridge um, and I've, I'm a SoCal California girl all my life. Um, my parents are from Seoul, Korea though. And um, going to focus on microaggressions. It's just, it's crazy how like it's something like a new term or um, has affected me my whole life. And it's like, we've only been started like recently kind of talking about it in the past few years, but it's something that's affected me like ever since I was a kid. And, and it's, and it's, it could be like really obvious or something super, super subtle. So like a big one could be like, I totally identify with those signs like, oh, like, where are you really from? Like, you can just simply ask like, hey, I'm just curious, like, what's your ethnicity? Or, but um, going from that or, oh, you're Asian, so you should be good at math, right? And like, but how is that racist if it's like a positive thing? It is still kind of discriminatory because I'm actually bad at math. <laughs> so um, anything, and even it could be as subtle as like, going to subtle things like if we're all going to an Asian restaurant and like my friends just like shove me to the front and say well like the owner can you talk to the owner because like and I'm like well why and they're like well because you're Asian so shouldn't you be able to like speak to the owner about this and I'm like what does that have to do with my race and or like uh, other subtle things like going to my career like um, the director of a company would introduce me to Asian donors thinking that just because we're both Asian they'll donate more money or some, some very subtle things like it's not meant to be like intentionally bad but it's still something like a decision or actions triggered by race like um, either obviously or like not and and it's something that it's like, it's like you said, it's a wound of a thousand paper cuts. Like it's something that doesn't really affect you, but later you get stressed out about it and you don't really know why, but it's something that like, if somebody like just slaps you a little bit, like every day, every day until it builds up and you just can't take it anymore. Like something like that. Yeah. So those are like the examples I've definitely experienced and I've definitely probably been asked like one of those things that from the signs that those students held up mm -hmm. yeah thank you for sharing it kind of illustrates the complexity and the nuance that is part of microaggression some of them are really overt some of them are very subtle and I love how you mentioned that this is something that's been affecting your whole life and we only mm -hmm. recently are starting to have the language to talk about it which is so important like once you know what something is you can start talking about it and start um brainstorming ways to do things differently um so it makes it a little more conscious um some solutions yeah. um here's a couple other ways that scholars have talked about it so um kristen i'd love to have you weigh in in just a moment if like you're talking about some of the nuances right so you yeah. can have ones that are very macro kind of assaults it's over deliberate discrimination and they might not think that their actions are harmful because they're like, oh, it's just a funny joke. It's a, it's a slur and they'll say, oh, I was just joking. Yeah. Um, or you could have a micro insult, which is usually like those more unintentional, unconscious discriminations, like where are you from? And you, or, or, or something like you speak really good English and you might mean that as a compliment, but the subtext is that you have an assumption that people that look like you don't speak. Mm -hmm very well, very good English. Um, the other one is a micro invalidation. So if there's any sort of pushback 
they'll be like, um, oh, you're just being too sensitive, stop complaining that, or, or potentially gaslight you and invalidate your experience or of how that could be hurtful because it's hard for them to imagine what that might feel like on the receiving end. So there's a couple different categories. I think, just let me check, Kristen, I think there was just one other, here's some examples. And then if you would like to weigh in as well, um, this is a macro assault, um, this girl sitting next to me, moves to sit closer to someone she's talking to. And this white guy whispers loudly that she moved because I smell like rice. So that's clearly a lot more overtly um, hurtful. This micro insult, oh, hey, your English is really good. And in validation, I'm not being homophobic or xenophobic or xenophobic, any of those phobics. Um, you're just being too sensitive. So, um, and then, um, I think there's just one other thing. Um, when Dr. Sue actually studied microaggressions with Asian American families and children, he found all these different kinds of themes and microaggressions have been studied with all kinds of populations. So African-American, Latino, um, uh, LGBT communities, and they kind of have some similar themes. And we're not gonna get into the weeds on this, but just to sort of illustrate that there's a um, lot, some of the typical themes and I think we've touched on a little bit is this idea that you don't belong. You're not really a true American. You're a perpetual sort of foreigner. So, you know, where are you from? Where were you born? Um, what are you? You look really interesting, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one, the description of intelligence, you know, you speak English very well, you're a credit to your race. There's this assumption that they're just not as intelligent as whites and um, somehow they're surprised. Or like we were saying with that math stereotype, you're sort of making this assumption that isn't yeah. um, even accurate. So I believe I just want to check in here, Kristen, as well. And I'm happy to go back to any slides you want to chat about more in detail, but. Yeah, anything can be, oh, uh, there was a story like when I was a kid, like speaking of like, um, like macro really aggressive stuff. And, you know, kids can be, it's just sad because kids are so innocent, but they can also say really horrible things. And when I was a kid, somebody's dog got lost in the neighborhood. And one of the kids was like, well, Kristen's family probably ate it because they're Korean and they eat like dogs or something. Like something as stupid as that comment. And as a child, it's so scarring. Like, oh, you, you're like, why would you, how, how can you say something like that? That's awful. And like, so it was sad because I had to run home crying and like tell my parents this. And even they were like kind of devastated like that somebody would say that, but my mom would just say they're just ignorant but just I mean like it's crazy like it's just yeah they're ignorant and people don't know better but it still like hurt my feelings you know so that could that's like an example of like something super aggressive from like something as innocent as just kids talking on the block <laughs> like your neighbors and things like that and um, micro stuff like I've experienced in auditions where I'm clearly from LA and I introduced myself very clearly, like said a few sentences, talked to the panel of audition, uh, the people auditioning me for a program. And, and then um, I sang a piece and I thought I sang it pretty well. And then the, one of the guys on the panel were like, well, is English your first language? Like, and I'm like, and, and it's, it's crazy because these aggressions cause like because we're so used to it or we were conditioned to it you kind of like especially Asian Americans I feel like we kind of are groomed to like laugh about it and go along with it which makes us feel even worse because I responded with oh English is my only language ha 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 but then I left the room feeling terrible and I'm like why did I why did I go along with that joke like, that's awful. I shouldn't be playing along with, I shouldn't be encouraging this behavior. And then it just kind of made me rethink a lot of things. And like, it kind of gave me like PTSD of what I went through as a kid or a teenager and growing up as an Asian American in America. It's, it's kind of like this crazy identity crisis thing that we have too. And um, just to, and it wasn't like directly an insult, but it was still like an assumption that really hurt my feelings that I also had to laugh about. So like both on both sides, it's just like kind of awful. And then the way, um, if I do get hired for something, like 
and the role has to be kind of sexualized in a way that's also concerning because Asian American women are kind of seen as exotic and over sexualized and it's like I don't want to be hired for that either so like the stereotypes that we've created or, or that we've like fallen into are kind of toxic too so I know that's like a lot to unpack <laughs> example but I have so many. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, it really, I mean, that um, exoticization uh, uh, of Asian American women, that was one of the themes we talked about in webinar one. And it also is one of the um, categories of microaggressions that Dr. Mm -hmm. Sue had identified as well. And you've so, your stories are so painful. And so thank you for sharing them and being so open and honest and vulnerable with us about that. And it, I think it just highlights how you're sort of stuck in a double bind. Like, you know, how do you, how do you respond? I mean, this is a person who can give you a job. They have a position of power over you. How do you engage in that? Um, do you say something? Do you speak up? How do you do that? Are you safe to do that? Um, how will that impact your relationship with that person? And so there's all this complex things that you have to try and navigate and just thinking, how do I even interrupt that? So you end up just going, being home, going home and being sad that, you know, like, yeah. how, do we, how, how am I supposed to, you know, interrupt that? Um, well, it's, back then, I wish I had said something, or at least had been clever enough to respond in a way to actually make it so that, hey, that's not okay. Um, but yeah, I was, like, ashamed back then that I even played, played like, along with it, and, and actually, now that this is like become such an issue like that we've that the members of the community of the asian american community in opera and theater we're talking about it but i you know it's kind of refreshing to know that all of us have done it at one point or another have played along with it because we were i don't know either conditioned or groomed to go along with it and now people are finally speaking up so it's kind of like better late than never i guess but everybody's had these painful stories of, yeah, like, I totally get you, and I didn't say something, but, you know, that's what I, why I'm here today is, like, to encourage, like, we just have to talk about it, like, it's, there's no right or wrong way to do it, and it's, and it's really case-by-case -case basis, too, right, because everybody has, like, different comfort levels about what they're comfortable addressing, and I, I don't embrace conflict like some people either, so it's, like, a hard thing to talk about, but you know, you have to have people in your corner. Like for me, my agent, he fully believes in, he, he, if something is, if he feels like something is um, wrong, like somebody hiring me because of my race, like he says, I don't think you should take the job because it's just, I think they just want you because you're Asian or I don't think they really are seeing past like your race. And so he will actually call out stuff like that. Um, and, and you need people in your corner to kind of like support who you are as like a person and not, not, not just based off physical looks and anything, but yeah, who you are as an individual. So just encouraging like, yeah, getting supportive people and like creating a space where everybody can just talk about it because everybody's gone through this. Not, not just Asian Americans, like everybody, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, and I really like what you were saying about that. Um, we all, you know, you need people in your corner. You need people who can ally with you, who will validate that experience and not mar, you know, marginalize or minimalize or gaslight mm -hmm. you and just be like, hey, you know, that's not okay. Um, and I love like they, it, these are kind of hard things to talk about, but I'm so glad that we are talking about it. Um, and I think you highlighted a couple of the impacts of. Um, of microaggressions, um, I I do I, I don't know, Kristen. Do you want to do you want to chat about this video? I know we had watched this earlier before. It is quite humorous. Um, it's a classic. <laughs> what did you say? It's a classic. I've seen. It's like a. It's actually a pretty old video. Like I've seen it, and I was like, wow, that person totally nailed it. Like. <laughs> So this, I think we will share, it's very short, and then I just love to hear your um, sort of commentary on this, because I think it beautifully highlights, A, what microaggressions are and how they might happen in an actual conversation, but also from a more humorous perspective, what would happen if we turned this whole thing on its head, and if, if you're maybe from a dominant 
group and you haven't experienced microaggressions, what might happen if we just flip the script and you were on the receiving end instead of the one that was sort of um, giving out the microaggression? Yeah. So I'm just going to, and if I know sometimes we assume there's some lag issues with video. So if for whatever reason this is not working for you, you can always just go to YouTube right this second and type in what kind of Asian are you? And it's the very first hit. But we're going to go ahead. I'm just going to um, swap out uh, my um, screen here so that we can go straight to the clip without an ad. And uh, we'll just maybe watch this together, Kristen, and then I'd love to hear um, your, your comments and insights on, on what's happening here, you know, and how is this a microaggression? Hi there. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. I, uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean. But I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. Yeah. Ham Shasina. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place near my apartment. So I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm just American. Really? You're Native American? No, uh, just regular American. Oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well. Hello, Governor! What's all this then? Top of the morning to you. Let's get a small tea, small tea! Double, double, toil and trouble! Mind the gap! Beware, Jack the Ripper! Bloody hell! Pip, pip! Cheerio! I think your people's fish and chips are amazing. You're weird. Really? I'm weird? Must be a crane thing. All right, we will stop there. Um, yeah, so Kristen, what are some of your immediate thoughts as you watch that? Well, definitely people have asked like, oh, where are you from? That's like such a, that's like the main question I, I think. And it, it, it sucks because there was like this really adorable like grandfather looking guy on an elevator as me and he like did the same thing and I'm like, ah, oh, I was having such a good day too. <laughs> and it sucked because he was such a sweet man and it's like, you can't, I couldn't like be mad at the guy, but it's like, really? Uh, and and it, it sucked because his son had visited Korea. So he was saying all these things. And I told him, I was like, well, your son probably knows Korea better than me because I've actually only been there once. And I've never even been to the place that your son went to. So maybe he could teach me more Korean than I even know or something like that. But it's like, yeah, I so wish, you know, we can turn the tables on. And it, it and it's like so funny how people think they're an expert on my own culture too. Like that's like the whole I really love kimchi kind of thing, and or the the mumbling of Korean words he thinks he knows and he doesn't really know it. Yeah, just just countless numbers of times that that's happened to me, and it's just it's like a like a ritual thing at this point. I'm like, really, we have to do this dance today, like. I, yeah, but it's it. It definitely like after after hearing it more than once, or like more than once a week or something. It's definitely been taking a toll. I'm not re not of recently, but like when I was growing up, for sure, it happened a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and I think some of the more recent research on microaggressions, they are actually particularly looking at adolescent development and racial identity formation and the sort of timing, duration, and dosage of those microaggressions and, and what the impact it has um, on healthy development. And I think this is where we start talking about, although, you know, even that person's in, in that person in the video maybe 
you know, maybe they thought they were just being curious and wanted to connect and maybe they had good intentions, but the impact is very different than what the intentions are. So it really involves that sort of um, empathetic leap to try and imagine if you were on the receiving end and you were getting those questions every single day for year, years on end, what that yeah. might feel like to sort of be this, this exotic other creature that, you know, somehow is not, you know, doesn't belong or something like that. Um, and so um, there's a couple examples. And I think we've talked a lot about this, but I think the thing that's interesting that I like about this is like um, that question, no, where are you from? It could mean I'm interested in you, but it also could send the other message of you're not an American and people like you are not real Americans and not my mm -hmm. equals. So there's, there's this sort of nuance and I'll, I'll show one other one here. You speak English well, again, this you're not American, you don't belong. Mm -hmm. And sort of because of how you look, you can't possibly have been born here. And so, um, those sort of subtext messages are really damaging. And so I'm actually gonna just jump ahead to some of the impact that the research says and love to have you um, weigh in. Just so if you're on the receiving end constantly, you can have that negative impact. And um, Dr. Kevin Nadel has, has um, studied this and has, has documented increased psychological distress, decrease in mental and physical health, increased anxiety and depressive symptoms, trauma, I know you had mentioned PTSD. Um, mm -hmm. in, in college students, we see binge drinking and alcohol related issues. We also see chronic elevated levels of cortisol. So that sort of fight or flight, am I safe? Is this, you know, I'm stressed out and that shortens mm -hmm. your lifespan. And um, there are some new studies coming out that are essentially saying that um, your blood pressure just doesn't even go down at night. Your body doesn't know how to rest from this sort of chronic low grade kind of stressor. So those have profound um, negative impacts, um, both on the individual. And then this is just a slide on society. It's just sort of part of that pyramid of violence. You know, we have these cultural microaggressions, but all of that is built on, you know, racism or sexism, et cetera. And it can it can really get to that point of where we're seeing that spike in anti-Asian American hate crimes and violence and harassment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I know that's a lot of content, but um, really yeah. just we're talking about the impact, like both personally and on society, these microaggressions, I know people are like, you know, that old adage, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. I mean, language matters, words matter. They can actually really, really hurt um, people and really have adverse health outcomes. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, I mean, talking about the negative effects of it, it kind of flows. I don't know if you guys, did you bring up model minorities yet, uh, Sarah, or like? We did that um, in the last webinar. Yeah, the, the, last webinar. the, myth of the model minority, yeah. So these microaggressions and the negative impact pact flows kind of directly into the model minority thing, where um, the microaggressions, especially against Asian American communities, because they're not, I mean, up <clears throat> recently it's been really bad with the, the, the violence against the Asian American community. But before that, it kind of, there was such a lack of representation of Asian Americans like in, I guess, I think it's like, you're always afraid of the unknown, right? So if you don't see like a lot of Asian Americans in the media, you kind of just fill in the gaps for yourself thinking like, oh, I don't really know much about them, but I think I know everything anyway. So I'm just going to assume many things about them, like myself. And like you, like people kind of fill in the gaps of what they think, how they think they are acting or how they should eat or how they, you know, are just as people. And um, I think that the lack of representation of like you seeing Asian Americans on TV or movies or the media. Um, which is also slowly changing now, you kind of assume like, oh, they're just, you know, they're just smart, hardworking people that eat like stinky food <laughs> um, and, and they won't, you know, speak up for themselves. And it, it kind of like, because of these microaggressions, it kind of makes our race it, like weak kind of weak-minded. I think that's the negative impact 
that it's personally that it's had on like um, people of um, Asian American descent uh, that we should just be grateful that we're seen as intelligent, hardworking people, but like, and, and, and that like, because we're seen in a more positive way, we should just shut up and be grateful that we are seen in that way. But, but as soon as we want something more than what that, than what we've been put in, in our little box, like as soon as we want, like we yearn for more bigger things, society is like, no, you can't have that because you're Asian or like, like you should be just happy enough that people accept, give you a seat at the table of being like these, these smart, like Asian people, like in the corner or something, you should just be happy that people see you somewhat positively. Like, isn't that, isn't that good enough for like you as like Asian Americans? Like, I feel like that's what American society kind of like they throw you a bone, so you should just be grateful for what you have. And like, it, it it's, I don't, I, that makes sense, right? Like, <laughs> so, um, so like all these things, these assumptions, like we have to almost just be able to carry it and take it because it, because it's not negative, negative per se, because it's not overtly aggressive or violent, like, that's that's what I feel like the burden of the model minority is, is that we can only have a little bit, like only so much, but once we dream to have more, then like it gets it gets more serious, it gets more negative, it gets um, and that's especially with the COVID thing, especially like they needed somebody to blame, so they blamed Asian people and um, or like, you know, they blame China, but then China kind of fit to them a com encompassed all of Asia and like it's it's just sad and like and to go further into that like that's that's why I always advocate advocate for like Asian Americans to be seen more in media in in music in I love BTS <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and um and you know films and it's it's like kind of I don't know if we're going to talk more in the positive light of that aspect but but yeah, like right now, like being the model minority, I think that's the biggest negative impact that these microaggressions have had on um, the Asian American community. Yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing. And you're so beautifully sort of connecting and interweaving like the themes of webinar one and webinar two with microaggressions. So hopefully if you've been watching all of those, you can start connecting the dots to see how these are all part of something much much um, larger. And I think our guest, one of our guests last week, Kim had mentioned again, that model minority, that expectation that you're silent and you won't complain and you won't speak up. Um, so, you know, how do you respond to microaggressions? You know, how do you change things if, if they're saying, if people aren't like calling it out and saying that's not okay, or that's not, that's not correct. And so I think that's our next, our next goal is to start thinking about some action items. Uh, how can I interrupt microaggressions? And there's a lot of different ideas here. I'm gonna share a couple ideas from scholars and then maybe um, things that maybe you've tried or things that you've witnessed that have been helpful because it, it does it does get really hard. And I do wanna give a big shout out to Hollaback. They have fantastic free training. Um, multi levels so you, you, on how to interrupt and how to not be um, how to be a sort of a positive bystander and give you words and skills and practices to so that's just a shout out to another resource out there. Um, Dr. Nadal essentially says this, that when we are thinking about how do I interrupt microaggressions, we want to um, address it directly and make sure we're challenging the behavior, not the individual, so we're not making it personal. Um, acknowledge the intent may have been good, but describe the impact, the, actual, the way that it can be hurtful. And then what you've been talking about a lot tonight, Kristen, is in just creating an environment where we can start talking about those microaggressions. And so, you know, there's a couple questions, you know, did it occur? Should I respond? And how should I respond? And, and like you were mentioning earlier on in, in this conversation, there's often a double bind, like if I respond, 
you know, could my physical safety be in danger? Will the person become defensive? Will this lead to arguments? How will this affect my relationship with this person? But if I don't respond, will I regret not saying something? Does that convey that I accept this behavior? So my silence is my consent. Um, and then just a couple, um, you know, what might be the consequences if, if, if you do respond or interrupt, you could get arguments, defensiveness, denial, further microaggressions or invalidations, or again, that regret, resentment, or sadness if you don't. So it's, it's tricky and it's very complicated. Um, and it's really important, especially if you're on the receiving end, because there's two parts to this equation. Um, are you safe? Are there trusted people around who can validate that experience? Um, and if you are alone, are there ways that you can seek help and support from loved ones um, through texts or calls or posting about it? Um, so there's lots of different sort of strategies. Um, if you are the person who is actually committing the microaggression, I think it's yeah. really important that you own it and you admit to, hey, you know, that was that was wrong and apologize and listen without trying to be defensive and don't deny or invalidate or gaslight them. Um, and just really commit to trying to be just a little more aware about your educate about your language and educate yourself on this sort of um, sharp learning curve. I think there's one more slide and then I would love to hear you weigh in. This is just, again, if because we're all human beings, right? We all make mistakes. Sometimes we don't realize that that could potentially be offensive. So, you know, getting comfortable saying, you know, thanks for correcting me. I hadn't thought of that. I was wrong about that. You know, thanks for letting me know I've changed my mind because there's no shame in being wrong, only sort of in refusing to learn. Um, we have to keep uh, checking in on that. So, um, your sort of thoughts about, again, the interrupting microaggressions. Um, I, yeah, I, this also kind of, we also talked about like being an offender versus an offendee. Yeah. And like, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's so difficult. And you can't like generalize how to approach this because everybody's comfort levels are so different. And, and you kind of have to like, kind of rely on your social tact skills to really weigh in on like whether, hey, this is a space where I can actually approach if you like if you're the third party in the situation and like if you know that something's wrong you have to definitely kind of assess the situation itself and be like well is this a person that's gonna like blow up and go crazy if I say hey what you said was I I think that was a little offensive if it's a situation where you can and it's a safe space I think that would be and you're comfortable with doing that like I think that's number one like that is a great thing to do like hey that was not cool like I I don't I don't know what mood you're in today or if you're angry or whatever but that wasn't cool like despite any mood you were in and um I think you need to apologize um but also if it's a situation where you can't do that I think the the offendee is like the most important like their feelings and and if you can kind of uplift them and become an ally to them and ask if they're okay, like that's another important thing. That's, and like, re regardless whether you confronted the other person or not, I think the main issue is that the person who received the remark is, as long as their mental health is okay. I think that's number one, that's important. Um, but going along with, cause I, you know, I'm definitely guilty of, being super ignorant and saying things that I didn't know were offensive. And um, like, I'm guilty of definitely like mishandling pronouns all the time. Uh, like I have a really good friend who goes by um, they, uh, the they, them pronouns. And I constantly slip up, but she always reminds me and I always go, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Uh, and then I correct it. And then she goes, thanks. She's like, that's all I need. You know, that's all people need is to just like, to just like learn about it, be corrected. And if you constantly have to be corrected, people don't mind. Like people don't mind, it's something new. The brain needs repetition, right? So you kind of have to mess up a lot to like learn. So I, and, and, and what I wanna address to everybody is like, like it's, oh, it's okay to like mess up. It's like, don't, 
don't worry. Like you don't have to walk on eggshells. Like everybody's gonna mess up at some point about like, or slip up or say something wrong. And, and like, I know I like believe in the good in all people. So it's like, always give a second chance. And if you try to, if you try to, let's see, address somebody and it doesn't go well, or they're offended, like always, you know, try again, try again. Like if you, yeah, if at first you don't succeed, try again. Or if you have questions and people are, won't tell you or are mean to you back because they're just get super defensive about it. Okay, maybe that's not the right person to learn with, go with somebody else. <laughs> And like learn from them it's just yeah like subjects like this are so sensitive and personal that it's never gonna like go off correctly on the first bat so like always always like everybody's different constantly have conversations with different people and you never know what you'll learn from like both sides but just as as long as you address it and talk about it and not treat it like the weird elephant in the room. I think like some kind of connection and knowledge will be gained <laughs> throughout all of this. <laughs> I really like that, Kristen, just like, again, sort of committing to that open sort of conversation and, and navigating through this kind of messy, um, complex um, sort of issue, but really checking in and, um, you know, honoring the fact that yeah we're going to mess up and we're going to make some mistakes but as our goal is to learn more and to become more informed um you know hopefully that will happen less as we just sort of have that more um increased awareness mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. about these things um i'm noticing our time we have just a few more minutes so i just want to highlight one idea and then we're going to open it up to questions that i i really like this idea um, calling in or out. And so really sort of determining at what point you need, to, you can call someone in to the conversation and invite more, you know, I think I heard you say this, could you say a little bit more, be a little more curious and invite sort of a learning context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's very nuanced because it depends on relationship and, and um, all kinds of different things or calling someone out and just saying, no, that's not okay. Yeah. Do you that's offensive. And I know sometimes the languaging of this is, 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 is difficult because you might see something and you don't really know what to say. And this happens to me, you know, where you think of the best thing to say, you know, three days later at two in the morning and you're like, oh, I, I wish I could have, you know, had that right on the tip of my tongue. But I think one of the most effective things that I've learned from others is if, if you want to call someone out and you don't exactly know how, often just the simple thing of just saying, ouch, everyone can recognize oh that hurts that could hurt someone and um that typically slows it down enough to, to be a pause point like mm -hmm. oh i didn't think about that and so this is just um dr ross has written about this you can check her out in the new york times talking about when we call in and when we call out and i don't want to get into the weeds on this because i want to spend time on um questions but really there are ways maybe how you approach it as a learning or growth opportunity um, calling in sometimes be a, a call out that's done with with um, love and in a more private context and not publicly shaming and things like that. Um, and some examples I just want to go here sorry to this last hypothetical situations um, calling in i'm curious what was your intention when you said that. Um, why do you think that is the case um how might your own assumptions be influencing this thinking how might that how might your this impact someone else so those are kind of a more sort of gentle way potentially of interrupting a microaggression where calling out is that nope ouch um i don't find that funny um i feel obligated to tell you that that comment is not okay it sounded like he said this um mm -hmm. It sounds like you're making some assumptions there that we need to unpack. So, so there's different approaches, and I think we all have different skill sets and personalities and, and ways we like to approach it. But just to give people some ideas um, about different ways to interrupt. Um, so, just want to sort of do a final check in, Kristen, with you about maybe some ideas of calling in versus calling out. And then I think we'll open it up to questions. Um, calling in as a uh 
like as a strategy mm -hmm. for interrupting microaggressions, you know, opportunities where mm -hmm. you have a chance to like maybe learn or teach. Yeah. Or I mean, I, mean I definitely, I definitely don't like, I'm definitely like, I can't hide anything on my face. So I'll just be like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and I do want to mention actually a lot of um, people that I've talked to is um, there's an actual, actual terminology of racial battle fatigue. And they're just very, very exhausted of always having to educate other people about why that's not okay. When, mm -hmm you could just do that own research on your own steam and not cause this negative impact, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard because it can happen in any space, like friends, like party or like good friends hanging out and you just actually get surprised by something somebody says. But yeah, you do have to kind of ooh, pause it and then just be like, can you clarify what you just said? Did you mean this? Um, what are you, hey, what are you trying to say? Yeah. Or like, yeah, that's, and it depends. Like, I think it is important to create the pause because like it can definitely just be glossed over. So, I mean, for me, I actually audibly just make a sound that of discomfort or something like, not ouch, but I'm just like, oh, oh. Or I go, oh no. Like, <laughs> my, my, <laughs> yeah the sound effects like oh <laughs> I'm like are we really gonna get into that like <laughs> yeah um but that's it's it's really hard to say can you clarify without sounding super I don't know like um like condescending about it I guess you're trying to you're not trying to teach a person a lesson or anything but Right. Yeah. Like, like, what do you, what you mean by that? Or something like, Oh, what do you mean? Like, I, yeah, it's, but I think, I think the most important thing, like I like your uh, tactic of creating the pause because everybody has to, it has to, everybody has to soak in on what just has been said, what has been said, like instead of, cause people usually when something's uncomfortable, they just want to get through it and like go past it as fast as they can. But if somebody like kind of uh, expresses that they're uncomfortable with an audible sound, I think that's, to me, that's what I would do. I think that's like the best tactic to do. And then I dress it from there, but. Yeah, I like that. It did, again, just, <laughs> you don't speed past the, the discomfort. Yeah, just the, oh no. <laughs> All right, so um, now is I should actually just advance to our next slide is, you know, what questions do you have or um, we have a few questions or comments in the chat, but this is your opportunity now to um, have a little bit more of an open conversation about microaggressions. Um, That was great. Thank you, um, Sarah. And thank you, Kristen. That was really fantastic. We've had, yeah, a couple people in the chat box. Somebody just commented they love Ouch, their favorite of them all. Um, <laughs> and I think that tied in really nicely is what you just kind of ended with, Kristen. Um, and then somebody asked early on in this presentation, one of the things that stands out to us it, is that Asian culture is presented in a blurry perspective in the Mikado. Many of the references seem to us to be more Chinese than Japanese. Is it a microaggression to confuse and conflate different cultures, lumping them in together as Asian? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is. I think, um, be just because it just portrays a lack of research. So instead of like, like Sarah, as you mentioned before, instead of assuming or just like um, kind of, or I, or I said, filling in the gaps on what you don't know and assume that you know, ask questions. Like just, just ask and people won't be offended if you don't know things because I definitely don't know things about other cultures and I would never assume um, anything that I don't know because I just, if, if you genuinely are curious and want to gain more knowledge, I think asking more instead of assuming more is just the best thing but it is it is definitely a microaggression if you mix um deliberately mix chinese 
Japanese, Korean, whatever, like any of any of the Asian cultures together. Yeah, it's just a little bit offensive. <laughs> <laughs> and all, I mean, and actually, if we were to, I'm not going to go back, but um, Dr. Daryl Sue, that is actually one of his, I think, seven or eight categories is that sort of pan-ethnic assumption that, you know, Asians are just interchangeable. They all look the same. Um, they are, I can just, I'll put them in this one basket and it somehow represents this monolithic experience. And, mm -hmm. and so a lot of the stereotypes are kind of fueling the, the comments or microaggressions that come from that kind of knowledge base. Yeah, yeah. It's like if you're saying England and France are the same or something. <laughs> like it's <laughs> to kind of just like if I were to create an example, I mean, that's offensive, right? That would be, I would be offending both <laughs> um like English and French people like yeah and after especially spending a lot of time in France like the French would be so offended <laughs> like, but it's it, it that's like what it is like if I were to create an example that like people could identify with it, it it would just it would just assume like based off looks that we're all the same and no it's not like I think then I think learning about different cultures is so important and it's something that's definitely interesting to me as well so I think like knowledge is power you know like if you do your research and 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 you still get it mixed up just ask just ask before you assume anything um what's there's no harm in asking questions I don't think that's offensive at all like well like except the where are you from question but like be more specific like if you're gonna ask that what change it to like I, I'm just really curious with your ethnicity I do that to people all the time and I ask those like oh is that offensive if I ask what your ethnicity is like I'm genuinely curious or like that's I don't think just be more specific about it yeah specificity is good too thank you um, we had another great question come in while you were talking. Um, if you're a witness to a microaggression and want to be an ally, what ideas do you have to intervene? Should you intervene? What would that look like? So if you're like the third party. Right. Like as, yeah, a witness to somebody else's microaggression. Uh, like that's, that depends on the situation, right? Um, if it's both easy and hard if it's with a close group of friends, I think, just because of the connections that you guys have. Um, obviously, you don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings, but at this point, somebody has said something that offended somebody, right? So if you are a person that like, I, I always say take everything by case by case basis, but definitely, I think it's definitely good to just be like, hey, that was not okay. Um, that's not cool. And you don't have to fight anymore about it. But I think if you just express from your point of view that you did not agree with that person, I think whether you continue the conversation with them or not about it, at least they know that something wasn't accepted by all. You know, It wasn't like the norm of society to go along with what they said. So just address, I think that's important to just be like, this was not right. Whatever you express this idea that you, the sentence that you had just said is not cool. And then the most other most important thing is that the offendee, the person who received the remark is okay. Like if they're all right and kind of just make it known that you support them and that you love them and that you're there to stand by them. I think to check in on their mental health is also the most important thing because it, it would have made a world of difference if I had somebody with me going like, hey, I saw or heard what they said and I just want to check in with you if you're okay. I think that's really important. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, so it's just about seven o'clock. Um, we had one more question, but that really just leads me perfectly into the fact that this is a five part series and this is just the middle of it. We have two more of these next week on Monday night, same time, 6 p.m. Um, and February 7th as well. Um, next week's is 
on the topic of how to be an ally, conversations with Asian American community members, um, with panelists um, from MSU's Asian American Student Association. So the final question that was mentioned um, is advice for students or anyone who are starting their journey into allyship. So if you have a short um, and sweet piece of advice, I know that's a really uh, big ask, um, but we'll close out with that tonight. So thank you, everybody. I think the most important thing, we got to talk about it, guys. Like, just talk about it. Um, make a new friend, you know? Like, reach out to the community. And especially, I shout out to all my friends who, when all these horrible acts of violence were committed against my, like, the, my community, um, a lot of my friends reached out and just, like, sent me words of love and support and it really, really, really made a huge difference. And I did feel loved and supported. And so if you don't, if you don't know anything about what's going on, or if you have no idea what to do, just talk to people and like reach out to a stranger and just, just have a conversation about it. I think, yeah, Sarah, do you agree? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I agree a hundred percent. And I think part of that conversation is listening like we really need to start listening very carefully to other people's experiences and seeking that out actively seeking that out mm -hmm. just talk about it keep talking about it talk yeah. about it <laughs> listen <laughs> great thank you so much everybody for joining us tonight thank you christian joining us from la we'll see you soon here um for the Montana Mikado. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Have a good Have evening. A good night.